Good morning, YouTube friends. Today I'm going to do a little bit different video than I would normally do. It's not going to be a you know guitar playthrough video or gear demo or anything like that. I figured what I'd do while I sit here and have my morning coffee is I would answer some of the frequently asked questions that people send in. And I also have some more specific questions that people have sent me that I figured, you know, I'd answer those and maybe it'd be beneficial and kind of fun or whatever. Um, so let's give it a shot. How come you never show your face or talk in videos? Well, here we are. I'm showing my face and talking in a video at the same time. Um, really, it's uh, it's never really been about this, you know, this video logging type thing. Um, for me, it's just all about guitar, about gear demos and things like that. It's not really about me. Um, so, you know, I'll cut my head off in the video, um, basically to get a better focus on the guitar or something like that. And uh, that's the reason for that. You know, it's like that's what it's all about. It's about guitar. What strings, tuning, and picks do I use? Uh, for my strings, I use Labella HRS Custom Strings. Yes, Labella. I have a dog named Bella, so when I say Labella Strings, she thinks like it's treat time or we're going to go for a walk or something. My gauges that I use are 9, 11, 16, 26, 36, 46, with a 62 low. Um, for my picks, I use Intune GP picks, and they're basically just like a Jazz 3, you know, um, but they got my name on them. For tuning, I still use Drop B flat or A sharp, whatever you want to call it, um, and also Drop A and then Standard B. Um, just kind of depends on the song, you know. What's my favorite scale length for a 7 string guitar? I think I'm going to have to go with 26 and 3 16 scale. And the reason for that is it's kind of in between that 25 and a half and that 27 or 27 and a half. So you kind of get the best of everything with that in my opinion. Um, you know you get tight lows, you still have you know nice vibrato or you know whole step bends are pretty easy still on the upper register. A lot of people ask how I do drum tracks, what I use for software, and how I you know, make them sound the way that they do. Um, so I'll show you guys how I do that real quick. All right, so the way that I do my drum tracks is probably the exact same way that everybody does their drum tracks that sequences drums. They use a piano roll type thing, and you know they literally click in MIDI notes in the piano roll using a virtual plug-in like uh, Superior Drummer or something like that. Um, I use Superior Drummer. Um, I like the Metal Machine kit and I mix it with some other stuff. I think it's got a cool sound to it. Um, and then, you know, for getting a good sound, I literally just bus it and, you know, add compression and, you know, EQ is really all it is so it's it's basically just got a parallel compressor with some EQ on it and you know to fatten it up um, the drums the way they are you know you can tweak them a little bit and EQ them if you go in here to your mixer you know you can kind of tweak the individual drums however you want but really you know they sound pretty good the way they are so I usually just add a parallel and then uh, put some compression and EQ on it to fatten them up a little bit as far as actually sequence, you know, sequencing them in the workstation, um, it's kind of just a matter of having a lot of patience and an idea to begin, you know, to start with. So for me, you know, sometimes I'll start with like a Korg pad control, you know, like a little uh, MIDI keypad that you, you know, you basically play it and record that and get some ideas going with that. Um, when I get a solid idea down, I basically at that point just literally click in you know each individual thing so like if you're looking at it here you know like this would be your snare you literally just program in your hits in the piano roll just by clicking with the mouse it's a ton of work I mean if you look at these tracks 
I mean, each one of these little dots on here is a click, you know, of the mouse. So it's a ton of work. You know, it takes a lot of patience and dedication. So just to get them to sound good and sound real is just a matter of having enough patience to do that, you know. Um, so, you know, there's really not a whole lot to it. That's just, you know, that's how I do it. And I think it's pretty much the same as the way anybody else does it. So, um... I think there's a bunch of YouTube tutorials even on how to do this, but it's just a matter of getting a drum plug in and clicking in the notes where you want them to go. That's really all it is for sequencing drums, in my world anyway. For audio recording, PC or Mac? Um, you know, it doesn't really matter these days, I think. Um, you know, if you have a fairly high-powered PC, you can record with it, um, you know, but if you want to use something like Apple's Logic software for recording audio, you know, obviously you're going to need to get a Mac for that. So really, you can use either. I, I personally have both. Um, for home, I have uh, a custom-built PC that I use because, you know, the specs on it are actually better than, you know, a Mac Pro or something like that. And for mobile recording, I have a MacBook Pro, um, and the reason for that is because it's a, a you know pretty high-powered laptop. It works really well, and the software that I use for recording is uh, Presonus Studio One Pro, and it's cross-platform, so you can use it on PC or Mac. What's a good starter rig for home recording? Um, for that. You know, there's a million different ways you can go, but, you know, if you're trying to get something inexpensive, you know, just to start and experiment with, uh, you don't need much, you know, to record audio. Um, if you can find even an off-the-shelf computer that's got a lot of RAM and, a, you know, a decent processor in it, that's really all you need to start out. And, you know, for recording guitars, you could get something like a Line 6 Pod, you know, any of the flavors of those things they have now. Um, and that'll act as an interface that you can use, you know, for guitar, vocals, bass, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, and then, you know, you need recording software. Um, if you don't want to buy anything right out of the gate, you know, you can go for something like Reaper. I hear about uh, that program a lot, people using that. Um, I don't know much about it. I tried it out and, and you know, it wasn't, wasn't really my thing, but um, I know a lot of people are using that and uh, swear by it so I checked that out and then uh, you know for drums um, hands down the only option for you know if you're not going to record live drums is uh, tune track products you know whether it be their easy drummer line or um, you know their superior line that's like the standard you know for this stuff so um, if you're going to record live drums you're going to need to get, you know, a mic set and, you know, an interface or if you get electronic drums or something like that, you know, you're going to need something that's got more ins and outs. Um, but I think if you're just going to do a small project where you sit down and it's just mainly you playing guitar, like the kind of thing I do, you know, that's uh, all you really need. You don't need all this stuff. All you really need is just a way to get the sound from your guitar into the computer, a program to record that sound with, and something for drums. What other hobbies do I have? Um, these days not very many. Um, I used to be into cars and stuff like that, working on you know air-cooled Volkswagens or lowriders and things like that. And uh, I love that. Um, you know that's that's a great hobby to have. But these days I don't have as much time for that, so I don't really. Uh, I don't really do it anymore, even though I'd love to. I like games, you know, recently uh, Guild Wars 2 has been dominating my life in the evenings. Um, I like sci-fi movies, um, art, been pretty interested in a lot of different artwork, uh, photography and videography and things like that have always been, you know, kind of side hobbies for me, but really, I mean, my biggest hobby is, is this, you know, this whole guitar thing. Will you share your Axe Effects, Kemper, or Superior Drummer presets with me? Sure, you know, uh, why not? But the thing about that is, you know, 
you're never going to get the exact sound you want out of presets. The best way to get a good tone, you know, for guitars or anything really, is just to sit there and tweak it until it sounds good for you and, and your rig and all that stuff. What do I think of Agile guitars? That's a really common one and, uh, you know, it's probably because I played them a lot in my older videos and I still have a couple of them. Um, you know, when I used them a lot, they were five to six hundred dollar guitars, and for that price, it was really impossible to find a 27-inch scaled seven-string. You know, with those kind of specs and stuff for that price. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you know, I could be wrong, but I, I think nowadays they're, you know, a couple hundred dollars more than they were back when I was using them. And I think when you start getting up into that price bracket. There's better options, um, an Ibanez or a Schechter Jeff Loomis or something like that, and you might get a higher quality guitar, you know. Um, but I think they're cool guitars. They're good workhorse guitars. Now they might be a little bit steep for what they are. Um, so that's my take on it. What's that thing on the headstock of your guitars in your videos? Now that is a fret wrap by Groove Gear. Now what that thing is, is basically it's a string dampener. Um, the way that I use it I think is a little bit different than the way it's supposed to be used, but it works really well. Um, you know, like for guys who are recording and playing solos and stuff like that, if you slide this thing up onto your fretboard like that, you know, you don't get any of those overtones when you're trying to play solos and stuff. Um, so, it, you know, it helps. It's kind of like a cheater thing that helps you get cleaner solos and sounds and stuff like that. But what I use it for is I put it up here on the headstock and basically, you know, if you do tight stalls and mutes and stuff like that, it kills those overtones, you know, that Chinese sound you get up here when you pick that. See? Put this on there, you don't hear it anymore. So that stuff doesn't come through on your recordings. Um, so it's a Groove Gear fret wrap. Check them out. What guitar bridge pickup do I use? Um, I use the SH6 Distortion, Seymour Duncan Distortion. How long have I been playing guitar? Um, I think I got my first guitar when I was about 12 or so, and uh, I'm 32 now, so 20 years. How did I get into this YouTube music business type thing? Um, that's kind of a long and complicated story that I might have to save for another time, but basically a good friend of mine talked me into putting my music online and on YouTube a couple years ago when we were digging through my closet. Uh, we found an old DV camcorder, like one of the big brick ones, and he's like, dude, let's, let's record some of your songs and put them on YouTube and stuff. And I was like, no, you know, I don't want to be that guy that you know, records his stuff and is like, look at me go, you know. Um, but he talked me into it and I did it. And basically, you know, the response was, was a lot better than I had ever expected it to be, obviously. And, uh, you know, it motivated me to keep going and, and do a little bit more with it. And, you know, now it's turned into what it is now. And, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate in that regard. But as far as how it got started, I literally just picked up a camera and hit record. How do you afford all that shit? Does music pay for that? What do you do for work? Um, I'm not rich uh, financially. I'm rich in the fact that you know I've had some really amazing opportunities, and I have you know great family and great friends and fans. I'm rich in that regard. Um, music itself, album sales, things like that. That doesn't pay for this stuff, uh, not completely anyway, um, because I give the music away. You know, I have it set up to where you know you guys set the price on it and decide what it's worth to you. Um, a lot of people have been really generous, and I'm extremely fortunate for that. But as far as that being like a, a reliable, steady income that I can pay my bills with, um, no, it's it's not that. Um, so what I do is I have other things, um, you know, that, that I've taken on, like mixing and mastering work, 
uh, guitar reamping um, lessons, you know, for guitar or production or anything. And, you know, that's been sustaining me for a while, um, you know, for the most part. Uh, but most recently, I got a job at Seymour Duncan uh, Guitar Pickups, where I do customer service and tech support, stuff like that. Um, and then, in addition to that, I'm doing, you know, like their audio demos for their high gain pickups uh, for their website. I'm working on that right now. Um, so that's my, my job. You know, that's what I do during the day, which is amazing, and I love it. Uh, but as far as music paying for things, um, it doesn't. But what it is, is it's the vessel that's kind of carried me into a career where I can do music-related things and still make a living. How do you go about getting sponsorships or endorsements? Uh, there's two ways with that, I think. Um, the first way is you just ask. You know, if you have something to offer a company in terms of marketing or promotion, you'll always get considered. And you know, if they think you're going to be a valuable asset to their team, um, then they'll probably hook you up with some kind of deal. Um, the second way is that you're already one of those people who has something to offer in terms of marketing and promotion, and a company will just offer it to you. You know, they'll be like, hey, we need to get this guy on our team because he's going places and doing things. He plays 750 shows a year, you know, and so that's really how you do it. It's you either ask for it or it's offered to you. Will you ever form a band with Ula England and or Jeff Loomis? Now, first of all, that's a super flattering question. I mean, imagine if someone asked you, will you form a band with Ula England or Jeff Loomis? Like, that sound, that's like really cool, right? I mean, those two guys are amazing musicians, amazing people. Um, I love those guys, like almost to an unsafe level. But as far as starting a project with them goes, um, you never know. Camper profiling amp or Axe Effects. Now, to me, I think they're kind of two different things, but, um, I mean both, really. You know, they're both really good at certain things. Um, the Kemper, I think that thing just sounds amazing and it's an awesome piece of technology. Um, you know, you don't have to have an amp rig to make use of it like a lot of people think. Um, I get that question a lot, like don't you already have to have an amp to use that? And you don't, you know. Um, you can import and export profiles into it and tweak them however you want so you don't need to have an amp to profile to make use of it so in that regard you know you can get so many cool tones with that thing um, but as far as taking it out on the road and using it you know if you play live shows and things like that um, it's not rack mountable yet um, and you know I would think it'd be a little more susceptible to you know road injury than something like the Axe Effects, which, you know, the Axe Effects sounds amazing. It's an awesome piece of gear, um, and it's built like a tank. I mean, I think you could probably throw that thing out a window and it wouldn't even damage it at all, you know? Um, so, in my opinion, I think the Axe Effects is great if you play shows and stuff like that, and the Kemper is good for in the studio, you know? It's, uh, it's, so it's really both, you know? They're two separate things. Do you have any tabs for your music? Um, I do. They're available on my website. Um, I didn't make them though, because I suck at that shit. What's my writing process like? Um, it's kind of a tough one because it's really, it's pretty different every time I do it. Um, but it typically starts out, and I know it's totally lame and nerdy, but it usually starts out with me getting inspired by something like, uh, you know, like I'll watch a cool sci-fi movie or, you know, see a cool piece of artwork that's like all spaced out and proggy looking, you know. I see stuff like that and it just like kind of paints a picture in my head. Um, and then I'll start kind of like developing ideas or, or stories in my head about themes, you know. And then when I come to write the music, it's basically like I'm trying to kind of score out these, you know, images or ideas or stories that I've come up with in my head. And I just try to write music to that, you know, what, what does that sound like to me? 
and it typically starts out you know with some riffs that are you know weird and may or may not even fit the ideas that I have but you know over the course of the whole process um, you know it starts really with sitting down in here once I have some kind of inspiration I grab a cup of coffee I start playing guitar and I build off that until you know I have something that transitions through the entire idea that I've had in my head and you know sort of fits a certain theme that I've developed um, but really it's just jamming you know I sit down and I jam and then I write out drum parts for it and you know add synth layers and stuff like that so really I mean my writing process is super chaotic there's no rhyme or reason to it at all it's just you know I get an idea and I come in and I, I just try to make something happen you know that reflects the mood or the inspiration that I have um, sometimes it works and sometimes it's like a dismal failure you know I mean I could spend an entire evening just sitting in this room you know trying to write something and it'll just basically be like you know being locked in a room with your own worst enemy you know if nothing works right and you know but sometimes you get you get something in there that you feel good about and you know um, so really the writing process is just like a cluster fuck of chaos all right so yesterday i had announced on my facebook page that i was going to do kind of like a frequently asked questions video and had asked if anyone had any specific questions and i got a ton of replies so i'm going to answer some of those now for you guys Okay, this one's from Mario. He says, what were you making for a living before you made it this far, dude? Dude. Um, I was working in the pool and spa industry. Um, I was a service coordinator for a hot tub repair company. Um, I had been working in that industry for a long time. Um, my dad was a, a pool contractor. He built swimming pools. And uh, so I kind of just followed that path for a long time and worked in the pool and spa industry. And uh, so that's what I was doing before. Okay, this one's from Rick. It says, how incredible has this whole journey been for you to go from bedroom shredder to where you are now? Um, amazing, dude, obviously. But, you know, I still am a bedroom shredder. I mean, I play guitar in this bedroom and this is where I write and record all my stuff that you guys hear. Um, I've had a lot of really fantastic opportunities, met a lot of really, really cool people, and, you know, it's turned into a really cool career because of you guys, you know, because of your support and um, all the interest, you know, that you guys have generated from all this. Um, so it's an amazing thing, man. Um, it's changed my life in a huge way. I'm super happy and appreciative every single day. Um, but really, I'm still just a bedroom shredder, man. That's just all there is to it. This one's from Jamie. She asked me, what's your favorite food? Um, that's a tough one, you know. I don't really have a favorite because I like a lot of different things. I like Vietnamese food a lot. Um, there's a Hawaiian place down the street. Um, every time I order that, I just absolutely just destroy it. It's so good. Um, whatever you want to come over and cook me will be my new favorite. How about that? Carl asks, what was the best advice you ever got from anyone? Um, that would have to be from Chris Adler talking about how to cope with haters. And he basically told me, you're nobody until somebody hates you. And we got on this topic because I'd had this strand of uh, trolls, you know, that were basically leaving me comments or emailing me saying I'm a piece of shit, and I suck, and I'm worthless, and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's just how it goes. Um, and people who do that sort of thing are the same people who are going to hit dislike on this video because they don't like me or they don't like what I'm saying or they think I'm an arrogant asshole or whatever. But, you know, coming from Chris Adler saying you're nobody until someone hates you, basically what he's saying there is your haters are just validating all the things that, you know, the people who love what you're doing are saying about you. Um, you know, so it really helped me kind of put it into perspective, like, well, why do they hate me? You know, they hate me because I'm doing well, I'm doing, you know, something with my life, and they're probably not. You know, so it says more about them than it does about me, and it just, you know, that kind of mantra 
just kind of helps me uh, helps me cope with the negative side of all this stuff. Fernando asks, did you go to music school or take any guitar lessons? Um, you know, up until a couple years ago, I never had any formal lessons or a book or video or anything on how to play guitar or do production or anything like that. Um, I just learned by ear and feel and trying to, you know, figure out things on my own and uh, play what I hear in my head, you know. I probably would have saved myself a lot of trouble <laughs> had I picked up some books and, you know, tried to figure things out that way. But I'm doing that now, you know. I'm, I'm trying to kind of learn things that help me identify what I'm doing and, you know, so I can put a word on, like, this is the scale I'm using and stuff like that. Um, because I really have no idea what I'm doing, you know. I'm just, uh, I'm just playing and... You know, whatever sounds right to me is, is all I know. Lars asks, Slayer, yay or nay? Dude, I grew up with Slayer, man. They were like the gateway to metal for me, you know? So, yay for fucking Slayer. This one's from a guy named Toast. He says, would you like to have a beer with me if you're ever in Melbourne, Australia? Bro, as long as you show me where I can like ride a bull shark or something, I'll be there. All right, this one's from Ezekiel. He says, um, well, actually, he's got a few different questions, but I'll just go, I'll pick one. Now, um, this one says, I'm sure your wife supports you, otherwise you probably wouldn't be doing it, but how did it work out? How did she feel about it throughout the whole time? Always supportive? Yeah, dude, um, I have an amazing life. I've known her since uh, freshman year in high school, and, you know, we've been together a really long time. I've um, been married to her for 10 years now. And she's always been super supportive. And I think if I didn't have her support, I wouldn't even be where I'm at right now. Because it wouldn't be possible. Um, so, yeah, she's amazing. And, you know, she's a lot of the reason why I'm able to do this sort of thing. Because I like to work off intuition and take these huge leaps of faith and go off on these adventures and stuff, and she's more stable and likes, you know, certainty and things like that. But the dynamic between us has is, is always been a really, really good thing. Um, so she's super supportive. She's an amazing person. Arthur asks, will you be working on another Demisery album? Definitely. Um, that stuff's way too much fun not to do again. Um, Gord and I have uh, started putting some ideas together and we have a session engineered to send back and forth. Uh, we'll probably be recording some stuff over the winter and uh, hopefully release another album next year. Um, so keep an eye out for that for sure. Matt asks, will you ever do tutorials on mixing and mastering? Um, you know, when it comes to tutorials, you know, I'm still the guy looking up tutorials trying to figure out how to do things. and. I don't think I'm necessarily all that good at it myself, so I might not be the best teacher. Um, so as for whether or not I'll ever do it, I mean, maybe, you know, uh, people ask me about it quite a bit and I think it'd be fun, uh, but it's just a matter of finding the time to do it. Alright, this one's from James, he says, what was your first guitar and what was the first thing you played on it? Um, the first guitar I ever had was a nylon string acoustic, like a classical guitar, and I played that for about two years. Um, the first riff that I ever learned was Iron Man by Black Sabbath. Jake asks, you have your signature Strictly 7, but it seems like you're always playing something else, like a BRJ or some other delightful thing. What's up with that, and which do you prefer? Um, that's a difficult question. Um, I'm actually no longer on the Strictly 7 artist roster. Um, I dropped off of it willingly, um, just due to some differences, you know, that we had in um, expectations, I think, were, were different. And, um, you know, I have a hard time committing to a signature guitar because you know obviously you guys have seen that I play you know a bunch of different guitars all the time you know 
and it's because I like a lot of different things and it's hard to narrow it down to you know just this is the Keith Merrow guitar or whatever you know um, so that coupled with you know some expectations on both ends that might not have really been met um, I'm no longer with Strictly 7 Okay, Eduardo asks, how do you do pitfall sweeps? I'll show you, dude. Alright, so what a pitfall sweep is, is basically a string rake with the pick where you fret out the strings as you kind of sweep across the neck. And the reason why people are calling it a pitfall sweep, I guess, is because it makes the exact sound that it did back in like the old Atari pitfall days and it's like you know like when you jump over like an alligator's head or something you know it goes makes that exact noise um, but I was using this in uh, I, I used it in a couple different songs like I have a song called um, uh, People of the Bog where it goes you know does that sweep and also uh, does that one and all they are is literally just raking down on the string, so that's all it is. And then, you know, the other one was, um, I can't even remember the riff. You know, you make that noise. You just drag the pick right across the strings. That's all it is. That's it. Pitfall sweep. It's like the dumbest, most easiest thing you can do on guitar. Kerman asks, how do you have enough time for doing all of this? Do you sleep? I'll sleep when I'm dead, bro.